Thank you to the organizers. And I see I've already what I want to talk today about is the asymmetric simple exclusion process. And it's an integrable model, but it's not of the determinal class. So different techniques have to be developed to solve this problem. But I'd like to give a little background about it first. Uh, so imagine you're on the integer lattice, and the, probably the simplest, the simplest, one of the simplest Markov processes is to have a particle, one particle, and let that exhibit random walk. So the probability p, it jumps one, one step to the right, the probability Q, it jumps one step to the left. That's arguably one of the more important stochastic processes. It has a nice scaling limit. And the basic, the basic quantity is the transition probability. So you imagine you start at a point Y, and you ask, what's the probability at time T that you're at a position X? Now, I'm considering random walk with continuous time, so you imagine this particle has a clock, which is an exponential distribution with mean one, and when that clock goes off with probability P, it jumps one step to the right, one step to the left. And it's not hard to see that the transition probability can be written as 1 over 2 pi i, a contour integral of c dx minus y minus 1 e to the t epsilon of c, where epsilon of c is p over c plus qc minus 1. And how do you do that? How do you get to that formula? Well, you write down a differential equation for the transition probability. And that differential equation reads as follows. You take d, t, d, t at x and t. And there's a simple way to write it out. You think of all the ways you can get into the state minus all the ways you can get out of the state. So I could be, if this is x, this would be x plus 1, x minus 1. I could be at x plus 1 and jump one step to the left. So I could have, if I were to get into this state, I could be at x plus 1 and jump here. So I have a q, p, x plus 1. I could be at x minus 1 and jump one way to the right. So that would be p of x minus 1. And to get out of the state, I could go p this way, q this way, p plus q is 1. So I subtract p of x. Now that's a kind of, and so x here is an integer, and that's a constant coefficient differential equation. And we could give it to an undergraduate. Normally, you'd solve it by Fourier series. But it's easy to see that if you differentiate this with respect to t, you bring down this factor. And that's precisely what you get when you do the right-hand side. Now, there's one thing you need to do, which is important. At t equals 0, this goes away. And this gives the Kronecker delta. And that's why you have to integrate it. And from now on, the 2 pi i will always be incorporated into the DC. Now, if we want an interesting interacting system, we're going to have to put in, we want to go to many particles. <coughs> 
And of course, we've got to, put, for it to be interesting, with the rest. Is there a reason that went off? It's the third one, okay. I know. So if you go to many particles, you have to put some interaction in. Otherwise, you just have independent. And so we're going to go to many particles on the integer lattice. And what we're going to assume, if here's a particle here, and these sites are empty, then it's going to be just as before. You can jump probability p this way, probability q this way. However, suppose you have a particle, two particles next to each other, and suppose this guy's alarm clock goes off, he flips a coin, it comes up heads, there's a particle there, that jump is suppressed. If he came up tails, if this one came up tails, then it would jump to the left. If you had a configuration like that, this guy's alarm clock went off, then it couldn't jump either way. And so you imagine infinitely many of these particles all carrying out these rules independently of each other. And that defines X, the asymmetric simple exclusion process. Asymmetric, because we're going to assume Q is not equal to P, so there's a drift in the problem. Exclusion because of the property there. And that's, that's the ASEP model. Now, what's interesting, well, let's first, let's, before we do infinitely many particles, let's do a finite number of particles. Eventually, we wanted to go in goes to infinity. So as a start, we'll start at two. <laughs> so now, again, you follow the procedure. You write down the differential equation. Now it's a function of two. You can think of the state, of course, when it's finite. You can specify a state of the system as x1, x2, xn, where xi is strictly less than xi plus 1. That's the exclusion. So those are all the states. So for 2, there, these specify the state. There's some initial condition, y. And you write down a differential equation. Now, those who've seen this, it's, it's a very old, it goes where the ideas go back to Hans Bethe in 1931, but it's not widely known in the probability community. So I'll spend a few minutes discussing some the ideas which we use. So we want to write down the differential equation, just like we wrote it down for one particle. So what do we do? Well, let's take x2 greater than x1 plus 1. Well, that means here's x1, here's x2, and there's some vacancies between them. Now, you notice that because there's vacancies between the two particles, they act as if they're, in, they're free of each other. This can, this can hop this way, this can hop this way, this way, this way. So this configuration is a two, it's like two n equals one problems. So you just write down two, when you write down the differential equation, x1, x2, dt, you're just going to write this down twice. I'll, I'll just write it out just.
So that's just the same problem twice. However, when they're, they're neighbors, if this is x1 and x2 is x1 plus 1, some of the jumps are suppressed. So if you write out the differential equation for that, so this is x2 equals x1 plus 1, then what do you have? Well, you could, you could, be, a, you could be here and jump in. So that's p x1 minus 1 x2. You could be up here and jump in. So that's q p of x1 x2 plus 1. And there's a, you could get out of the state by jumping this way or jumping this way, p plus q is 1. And so you have a 1 there. Another way of saying this is the, the differential equations, the Kolmogorov equations, are no longer constant coefficient. And so it's not so clear how you solve this. I mean, if you have not seen this before, and of course we want to solve it subject to the condition that we get the Kronecker delta. And how do we do that? Well, there are two ideas. They go back to Hans Bethe. He wrote one paper in this subject. If you do a Google search on Hans Bethe, Bethe onslaught, you get about a, over a thousand hits. So, what's the first idea? I'm going to call that first equation the easy equation. I'm going to call the second one the hard equation. Now, if the easy equation held if, big if, if it held for all x1, x2, and z2, then we just use Fourier series to solve that problem. It would be, they're just independent particles. So what we're going to do, we want to get rid of the hard equation. So how do we do that and still have it satisfied? Well, we assume that the easy equation holds when x2 equals x1 plus 1. And we subtract from it the equation that we want. And that gives us well, you can see, if I subtract those two, I'm going to get something like q p x1 plus 1 x2 plus p p of x1 x2 minus 1 minus p of x1 x2. And I'm going to assume this holds for all x1 x2, well x2 here is x1 plus 1. So this holds for all x1 and z. So the idea is I'm going to, I'm going to take this as a boundary condition on the, for the easy equation. So I just want to solve the easy equation subject to this boundary condition. And then if, it's, if, if it satisfies this boundary condition, the hard equation is automatically satisfied. That's beta's first idea. So the question is, how do we solve the easy equation subject to those boundary conditions? Well, we take two complex numbers. Here we just have, in the n equals 1, we have just one complex number. And it's easy to see that C1, the X1, C2 to the X2, E to the T epsilon of C1 plus epsilon of C2 
This satisfies the easy equation because it's just the multiplicative. You just multiply the two solutions together. Of course, that solution doesn't obey the boundary condition. So it's not the solution we want. Now I can multiply this by a constant. And I can, now I can also get a solution by permuting the C1 and C2. So I'll call it A, let's call it A12. A21 of C, and I have C2 to the X1, C1 to the X2, and then I put in that same factor. And what do I do? I plug this into this boundary condition. And that determines A21 in terms of A12. But of course, this doesn't satisfy the initial condition. So I choose A12 with a same type of factor. So I choose A12 of C to be that C1 to the minus Y1 minus 1, C2 to the Y2 minus 1 minus 1. And then I integrate it. And that, I won't write down what the A21 is, but it's just a simple algebra to figure out what that is. And now, I say, well, that satisfies the differential equation. It also satisfies the boundary condition. But we have one more thing to check. Does it satisfy the initial condition? Well, if you look at this, with this factor, when you put t equal to 0, this goes away. And by the same argument of the residues, if the contour encloses the uh, origin, you get the delta function here. So this term gives me the delta function. That means the other term has to be 0 at t equals 0. It's not. <laughs> However, it doesn't have to be zero everywhere. It only has to be zero in the physical region, which is x1 less than x2, and y1 less than y2. And if you check in that region, the integral is zero. If, if, and that's the big if, if you choose the contour such that all the singularities, this will have singularities, all the singularities except the ones at the origin lie outside the contour. So you, you have to choose the contour so that the singularities lie outside. And you've solved n equals 2. Now, so now you want to try this for general n. But you have to check something. Suppose you have three particles. There's going to be a new configuration like that. And that would lead to a different differential equation. But you have to show, and in this case it's very easy to show, that the boundary condition which comes from two particles implies this three-particle boundary condition. That's the origin of the Yang-Baxter equations. It's saying that the two-particle boundary conditions imply the three-particle boundary conditions. So now you carry this out in general. And now I'm going to turn off the lights. Let's see. Which one? How do I bring these things down? Sometimes he wants to be pushed before being pushed down. Uh, no, Oh, and before I turn off the lights, I'll just say one of the things we're headed for, this, is, this result's about 10 years old. We're going to look at the position of the Emps particle in ASAP. We're going to, it grows linearly with time. We subtract that off, divide by the famous one-third exponent of KPZ. 
This is for step initial conditions. That means initially the particles are on the positive integers. And the limit law says that this is function F2. And this is a result from about 10 years ago. I'm going to explain where this comes from and then some generalizations which we've done recently. Okay, so there's what I talked about. There's the definition of ASAP. There's the one particle. Here's the theorem. For n particle, there's your initial condition state. There's your final configuration. We define this factor right here. Those familiar with uh, the XXZ model will recognize this from Yang and Yang's work in different variables. And what the theorem says that you have the sum over the permutation group. You have n dimensional integrals instead of two now. You have a coefficient a sigma. A sigma is given by this formula in terms of the u's. And there is this, and this factor right here, you recognize is just the free particle part that came from what I've shown. And if you choose the radius so small that all the poles of A sigma, and there are a lot of poles, lie outside of the contour, then the identity permutation gives you the Kronecker delta. And you have to show, in the, in the, the what makes it a theorem, you have to show that in the physical region, the n factorial minus one other integrals all go to zero. Unfortunately, they don't individually go to zero. You have to show them in pairs and put them on this. It's a little tricky. Tricky enough that when we first published the paper, we got the argument wrong. We had to write an errata. <laughs> but so now we have the transition probability. And this is a really a basic object of Markov processes is that we have. This is, there are very few form, exact formats for transition probabilities for interacting particles. However, you could argue, and you would be correct to say it, is how in the world are you going to get any information out of this? It's n factorial terms. Each term is an n-dimensional in integral, and you want to let n go to infinity. It doesn't look hopeful. So what we do is we look at marginal distributions. And in the marginal distribution, here's a marginal distribution. Oops. Where, yeah, wrong button. Here's a marginal distribution, the probability that the nth particle is at x at time t. And of course, how do you get that? You get that by summing over all the allowed configurations, which give you that configuration. A second example, and this is the new work, is suppose you want the nth particle to be at x, and you want it to be a part of a block of particles of length, say, 4. So what's the uh, probability that the nth particle is at x, and it's, in the be it's the beginning of a block of 4? That's the second. Now, you could just say, why did we consider this problem? Well, we're really interested in developing techniques that extract information from the, from the transition probability. Endpoint correlations would be one thing. This is a very special endpoint correlation. And we're able to say something, and we learn something in the process. Now, when you sum, let's take for the first, the first one, Let's take, uh, let's take the leftmost particle, x1, and sum, uh, rather than do the nth particle in the beginning, let's take the leftmost particle, the first particle, and ask its marginal distribution. So that means I have to sum all the x2, x3 over all possible configurations. Now, since the contours are small, This is not going backwards, let's see. Yeah, since the contours are small, for the summing over all the configurations x2, x3, all I have to do is bring that sum inside, because this is uh, of absolute, the x is 
the c's of absolute value less than one, and I'm summing these over positive integers. And so that's a geometric series. So I can do that. And when I sum it over geometric series, I need an identity. So this is the part, this stuff right here is what you get from just summing those geometric series. And yet you have this sum over the permutation group. And what you get, well, when L is one, you get, that's what you get right there, which is a very simple symmetric function. As L gets bigger, these symmetric functions become very complicated looking. And I don't have a nice, in, in this representation, I've tried them in various bases and they all look complicated. However, we found that this symmetric polynomial has a nice represent, contour integral representation. And so you define this function of L complex variables. Notice the C's appear as a product. This turns out to be crucial. And so if you do this contour integral where this encloses a point CJ, this contour integral equals this symmetric function. And so we'll, we use this representation. And that, that simplifies the problem enormously because you've done the sum over the permutation group. So you've, limited, you've, you've gone from n factorial terms to essentially one term. At least that's for x1. Craig, excuse me, I'm a little bit confused by the notation. What is u? What is what? u. Oh, yeah, sorry. I, I showed that earlier. I should have repeated it. Oops, I'm going the wrong way. How do I go? How do I go backwards here? I can't go backwards on this thing. I. There we go. Okay, now we're going. There's U right there. That's U. Actually, if you uh, go back to the Yang and Yang paper on the XXZ model, that's the Yang and Yang S matrix. Okay, so that's U. And, and so this first identity gets rid of the sum over the permutation group. Now, the problem arises when you try to do m equals two or higher, because if I'm supposed I'm at the third particle, that means x1 and x2 have to be summed to the left, and x4, x5 is summed to the right. And when you do that, the sum to the right, because the contour is small, it's, you can bring the sum inside and do the geometric series. However, for x1 and x2, if you're doing, if you want, if you fix x3 at x, then you're summing in the, where the geometric series doesn't converge. So what do we do? Well, what we do is we expand the contours out, do the sum, make the contours large, do the sum, and then bring the contours back in. But in the process of bringing the contours back in, we cross all sorts of poles. And we need, it turns out we need a, a certain identity, which uh, is kind of a remarkable identity. It says fix, a, fix a set, oh, here's the U again, I did repeat it. Fix a set of size M, M less than capital N minus L, and take the I variables in S, the J variables in the complement of S, and you form this product and it reproduces, so, and this is a Q binomial, tau binomial coefficient. It's almost like an eigenvalue problem. And those complicated sy symmetric polynomials satisfy this identity. And that identity is crucial in being able, to, when you bring the contours back in, it's crucial in terms of uh, making things simple. And what do you get? Well, you get, let's see, let's just look at it here. You get some series for this uh, probability. 
Now, we still haven't, we still haven't taken the n goes to infinity limit. It turns out you can expand the contours out and you get an infinite series and you can take the limit n goes to infinity. And so this is an exact formula for that probability. Of course, it's still a mess in the sense you can't analyze it asymptotically. But let's, let's specialize the step initial condition so the particles start off on the positive integers. That's called the droplet initial condition in KPZ theory. And we're interested in this probability, this large contour representation we, we work with. And you can get, massage that formula a little bit, and you can get all of those sums turn out to be a contour integral of a certain Fred Holm determinant. There's a kernel up there. So this is the kernel that you saw before. And these are those factors that, that define the symmetric polynomials. And so this formula is now reduced down to, well, this is an exact formula. Now, when we did this initially for L equals one, this is kind of a surprise. Why is it a surprise? This is not a determinal process. So there shouldn't be determinants in the problem. <laughs> I mean, morally speaking. But we found, in fact, it's in a uh, contour integral involving a Fred Home It doesn't mean the endpoint correlations are determinants, but this, these particular one-point correlations and these block correlations, they are for integrals of Fred Home determinants. Now, I only have about five minutes left. Unfortunately, uh, depending on your point of view, um, it's hard to analyze that Fred Home determinant asymptotically. It turns out the M is not inside here, so it's, it's hard to let M go to infinity. And there is a, there's a theorem. We, when we got to this point 10 years ago, my colleague, Harold Whittem, who's a brilliant analyst, said, well, we have to deform the Fred Home determinant. And the deformation is not the unitary transformation of the operator. I know, I understand those type of deformations. But he said, we're going to deform this in such a way that the Fred Home determinant remains constant, the same, but the operator changes. And it's not a similarity transformation. And I said to him, where do I read about this? And he said, in a paper I wrote in the 1960s. So, so it pays to work with a brilliant man. So I won't go through this, but there's two propositions which tell you when you can add a certain operator to the original operator and still keep a Fred Home determinant. So this, this turns out is absolutely key to getting an operator. And the operator we get in the end, it, we call it the J kernel. You see it's got this M is inside the kernel now, and this has the structure, this has the structure of uh, things from random matrix theory. This we can do saddle point analysis on. And there's a function here. This is a famous sum, the Ramanujan sum. And uh, so what do we have in the end? We have this contour integrals, and we have the probability that time t, the nth particle, is given in this, and we do asymptotics, and our new result is, well, first we recover this result. When L is one, there's no block. This is KPZ universality. And I should mention, the, the, the universality here is remarkable, that for TACEP, Kurt Johansson about 2000 calculated the, in TACEP the same thing, and the only difference the C1, the C2 are exactly the same. The only difference between our formula, which was derived using beta onsets in a, in a non determinal thing, and his, which is determinal, is that time is scaled by this asymmetry parameter gamma. Otherwise, it's the same formula. That's a strong statement of universality. In fact, when you first start this problem, ASAP, you don't, I, I was not expecting this. The, the physicists were, by the way. But uh, <laughs> because if you think about ASAP, think about the leftmost particle. And if you're a TACEP, you can only jump to the right. 
or the left, depending which way you're going. And uh, the other particles have no effect on it. So the leading particle is like a one particle system. But if you're in ASAP and you look at that leading particle, it can jump to the right and the left and it eventually interacts with the infinite number of particles. So that from that point of view, ASAP and TASEP are really quite different. However, we're deep inside the problem and the intuition is it's got to drift, it's got to be the same answer. And that's what we proved in this case. And the, for a general L, where this is looking at a density, we find, let me just read this corollary. The conditional probability that the nth particle from the left is the beginning of an L block, given that it is at x at time t over gamma, has the limit sigma L minus one over t. What that means is, stated in words, <laughs> is you condition that the nth particle is at x, and then you ask, what's the probability that I have a block of length L? It's a Bernoulli process with parameter uh, square root of sigma. So you just put down the square root of sigma and you get it. So the, the system's a Bernoulli process. And so all of that analysis led to just this simple factor at the end. That's it. Are there any questions, comments? Uh, can you carry over this analysis to the symmetric case when P equals to Q? Because then you are, I guess, I'm not sure, you are going to see a crossover from KPZ to another class. Well, we haven't we done that. The symmetric case has been done by Derrida using our formulas. But as far as I know, I mean, really, that's what, um, that's really what Corwin and company and Sasamoto and Spohn did, that the KPZ uh, scaling function is the crossover between, it is the crossover function between KP, the asymmetric and the symmetric. So there's a crossover function there. And they, they took our formula for the J kernel about 10 years ago, nine years ago, and they scaled it in what's called the weekly asymmetric limit. That is, we kept, when we did the asymptotics, we kept this asymmetry parameter fixed. But if you want to look at a crossover scaling function, you've got to scale this to zero at the same time in a certain power. That, they started with our J kernel, which is an exact formula, and carried out the asymptotics in that as weekly asymmetric limit. And that they identified as the KPZ tau function, or uh, the solution to the KPZ equation. In other words, it gives you the distribution of the height function. So the answer is yes, that's essentially been done by Corwin, Costell, Amir, Sasamoto, and Spohn. They're two independent groups. Are there any further questions? No? I just wanted to know, could you say uh, again what the different initial condition is and maybe what, for what initial conditions is it now known how things behave? Well, we did it for step initial condition, which is all the particles on the positive integers. We also did a problem when it's step Bernoulli. So that means on the half line, you put down the particles on some Bernoulli process. Uh, I think uh, graduate student did every other one. And uh, Jeremy and, and company have written out the formulas for the uh, stationary one where, not stationary, the uh, flat initial condition. They, they have some formulas. I don't know if they've done the asymptotics. There's, Jeremy says there's some technical problems there. But that's a lot more, the, the flat initial condition is much more complicated. That's the one that would lead to F1. And the step Bernoulli, you see a crossover between F1 and F2 and Gaussian. Any other questions? 
Anyone? No? Okay, let's thank the speaker again then.